Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's edition of The Verdict. I'm really excited to get stuck into the Betfred Derby Festival, which saw a brilliant winner of the Derby in City of Troy, a really good winner of the Oaks in Azalea, and some very interesting supporting races, which we will analyse utilising the race IQ data. We're going to start on Friday, which was Oaks Day, of course, and the ground was on the easy side for the start of the meeting, officially described as good to soft, and these times reflect that, I think. TJ, a two-year-old in the first, 5.64 slower than standard, and there was quite a slow time from Luxembourg, but that was to do with tactics in the 310, and we'll look at that again shortly. The Ezelaya time, nothing flash, 2.42.06 plus 6.86. Two things at play with those times which were verging on soft ground. One was the ground, and two was the headwind up the home straight, which was relatively strong. Now, let's have a look at the Race IQ Time Index for those races. And you'll see that most of those scores are below what you would have expected uh, for the races that were run on soft ground over the trips that they were run over and the class that they were. TJA, the first race, just a score of 1.37, 4.03 for two tempting, 2.9. Uh, for Luxembourg, just about bang on the average for the day of 2.83. Then you had uh, Bolster, 4.53, relatively strongly run. We'll look at him later. Azalea, 3.06, and finally Evade and uh, Ross Collin. Quite steadily run, really, quite slow finishes to those last couple of races. What you would expect is a score between five and six, somewhere there. So uh, these numbers affected by conditions and how the races were run. And that's what we're going to analyse now by getting stuck into the Coronation Cup, first of all. Let's have a look at the betting. Emily Upjohn, a brilliant winner of the race last year. Seven to four favourite. Slightly negative vibes from the Gosden Yard there about her possibly needing the run. Luxembourg, nine to four from 11 to four. Hamish, four to one, stepping up in grade. Feed the Flame, the uh, French raider from the Pascal Barry Yard, six to one. Time lock, a 12 to one shot. OK. Let's see what happened as far as Luxembourg was concerned, who beats Hamish and Feed the Flame. He comes from stall three, the second from four, the third from five. And tactically, this is brilliant from Ryan Moore. Nobody wanted to go forward, and he was happy to saunter into the lead and dominate this race. He was able to quicken when he wanted to and catch his rivals napping in behind. It was a, a brilliant ride. For a moment or two, it looked like time lock up on the outside, who was quite keen in those cheek pieces, was going to press for the lead. But uh, Ryan stayed a little bit wider than time lock, who's been angled towards the inside and was never really pestered. And he really is dawdling along here over this mile and a half trip. If you ran this in conjunction with the Derby and uh, the Oaks, you would see that he was quite a long way behind the leaders of both of those group ones at this stage of the race. Uh, in behind, Emily Upjohn, she's wide without cover and she's a bit keen as well. And I think that affects her finishing effort in the closing stages. The finishing speed percentage here was probably what you'd expect, well over 100. It's 112.21, so he's 12.21% uh, quicker through the final three furlongs than the rest of the race. Now, it could have been bigger than that because Ryan turns on the gas quite a long way from home to put this race to bed. If he'd sat a bit longer and waited and continued to fill the tank up, he might have been able to finish even faster than that through the final couple of furlongs. He reached a maximum speed, Luxembourg, of 40.77 miles an hour, and his fastest furlong was the 10th furlong. So uh, from the three to the two, he went 11.29 seconds. Uh, that was his fastest furlong. But this is where Ryan Moore is beginning to think about getting on with it. He's coming down the hill, he's going to swing into the home straight, and normally he would probably sit for a bit longer, but he actually goes. You can see horses in behind are coming off the bridle, and Ryan's away and gone. He's decided to go. Emily Upjohn still seeing loads of daylight, but Ryan has quickened. He went through furlong 9, 11, 34, furlong 10, 11, 29, and furlong 11, 88. And there was no way he was going to be caught after he was able to extend his lead swinging for home. Thereafter, this horse gets a little bit tired in the final furlong, and Hamish does make up a little bit of ground 
white colours, black cap, but he can't make up enough to threaten Luxembourg. Final two furlongs, Hamish a bit quicker, 35.5. Luxembourg, 35.83. Ryan had done the damage, saving petrol early on and then quickening off the turn, stealing a few lengths, and he was never going to be dragged back after that. He is an admirable character, this fella. This is his fourth Group 1, and he's destined to race in more this season. Uh, Aidan O'Brien mentioned the King George after this, and that's possibly where he'll go. It's hard to think he'll get a setup like this in the King George, but uh, he'll be ridden prominently there, and if there's a bit of a dawdle, he might be the one to take advantage. And this was a massive step up in what he produced in Dubai Maidan. He ran in the Dubai turf there. He was massively disappointing, but that was early in the season, late March. He probably wasn't ready. He probably needed the run, and he was seen to much better effect here. Need to mention Feed the Flame. You see him right towards the outside. He's run pretty well. The sectionals have got him coming home quite nicely, but he was too far back. He was way too far back in what was a, a steadily run contest. Now, he's used to steadily run races in France, going steady and then quickening, but you can't do that from such a positional disadvantage. So I think you could rate him as still being in form. This fellow, Luxembourg, well, he really is in good nick, and he's a handsome-looking fella, isn't he? Let's sum that up with the race IQ data. You can see that he was second quickest to 20 miles an hour, Luxembourg, 2.68 seconds it took him. Time lock was actually quick as 2.67 and thereafter a bit keen in the race. There's that 40.77 miles an hour that he got to through that 10th furlong, which was his best furlong. 11.29 seconds he took to complete that. And look at all the finishing speed percentages. They're all over 100. You probably expect that in this race. Emily Upjohn was well over 100 last year as well. But uh, Ryan Abel to dictate and that made all the difference. Carl Burke has his horses in fine form at the moment, and we're going to look at the success of Bolster, who made every yard of the running to win the 3.45 on Friday. It was the Betfred Nifty 50 handicap. It was over 10 furlongs. Liberty Lane, 9-2. Bolster was a 5-1 to one shot. City Streak, 15-2. to two. Derry Lad, 15-2. to two. Haunted Dream, 8-1. to one. Little Touch, 11s, and it was 11s and bigger. Uh, the rest. The two horses need marking up in this race. I'll, I'll point them out to you straight away. Haunted Dream and Derry Lad. Nothing really went for them. Everything went for Bolster, though. Let's take it from the start. He's from stall number three. Uh, Paladias from 11. Derry Lad from stall number eight. Towards the outside, you see Haunted Dream stumbling coming out of the stalls. There was Bolster's brake speed. Eighth fastest, just eighth fastest to 20 miles an hour. But Pierre-Louis Jamin was keen to get him forward and take him to the front. And that's because they changed tactics with him last time out and made the running at Pontefract. And he won in sensational style. It was cut in the ground that day as well. And he fair bolted up in a really fast time. So they were anxious to repeat the dose. And they did just that with him here. Uh, they went reasonably hard in the early part of the race. And then Pierre-Louis Jamin on board the winner just eases him down, coming down the hill, and then he's able to finish off evenly in the closing stages to record a finishing speed percentage of 108.28, which means he's got through the final uh, three furlongs in 8.28%, quicker than he ran the rest of the race. That's courtesy of him being able to fill up coming down the hill. You see they're concertinaing up a little bit. They're all on top of each other. He's definitely steadied the pace here, and that then allows Bolster to just quicken up once he's turned in. Now, he doesn't go when Ryan Moore went. You can see there the grey horse getting hampered a little bit as well as he switched to the outside. So for that horse to finish fourth was a good effort. He waits a little bit, Pierre-Louis Jamin. Ryan would have been going about now on Luxembourg. He'd have been off and gone. Pierre-Louis Jamin's going to go over that road crossing, and he's still sitting tight, still sitting still. Still waiting. I'll point out Derry Ladd quickly, right towards the back. White cap, red body, stars on the sleeves. Gets loads of trouble in running. Needs marking up. Now Pierre-Louis Jamin goes for this horse, who does an 11.54 through furlong eight, and furlong nine, 11.78. Now that's not him quickening in spectacular fashion, but he definitely quickened because he saved something coming down the hill, and he runs on quite well in the closing stages. He kept rolling. Here comes Pada Diaz, who was dropped right out the back. Derry Lad coming as well, who'd been dropped out the back too. 
they were at a positional disadvantage and this really was a very well judged ride from Pierre-Louis Jamin. Go back to Derry Lad, he was fastest in that final furlong. You can see there he's in behind horses, about four from the right, behind the horse with the yellow cap, can't get out, can't get out, Haley Turner sitting and suffering, but this horse still comes home well in 12.3. And Derry Lad had the best finishing speed percentage in the race, 109.64. So Healy's marking up, Paradios perhaps marking up a little bit as well. This is a real good performance though from Bolster out in front and plaudits to Pierre-Louis Jamin because he'd have been tempted to go really hard throughout this race once he'd got to the front, but he saved a bit and that, that was really important. And the general point about Bolster is he's improved massively now for the Carl Burke team since they decided to run from the front with him and do so with some cut in the ground. I think both of those factors are pretty important to him. Whether he'll be able to do that next time out, who knows? It's always difficult to keep dominating races. But perhaps in a, a listed race, perhaps stepping up to a listed race, there's only seven or eight runners. He might be able to do just that. France might be the place for him as well to do that, where there's a bit of cut in the ground. Let's just have a look at uh, that race in terms of the race IQ sectional graphic which uh, just explains what's happened uh, through the race. So you've got the sectionals at the bottom, two furlongs, three furlongs, four furlongs, etc. And you've got the sectional times on the uh, left-hand side of the screen. So you can see that Pierre-Louis Jamin is trying to rate him on 12.5. Then he's got a 13.25. As the line goes up, he's getting slower. Then he's gone 13.53. And he reaches a peak, top of the hill, of 13.93 and starts to roll down the hill. Now this graph is not describing the topography, it's describing how fast he's going through every furlong. But you can see from that peak, he starts to go a little bit quicker. 13.22, then a 12.15, then an 11.54, and that 11.78 that I referred to. And then he gets tired as the graph goes up again for 12.75 final furlong as Derry Lad closes in on him in the closing stages. But it's a good ride from Pierre-Louis Jamin. He went as hard as he could in the early stages while saving a bit and then just gradually wound it up and allowed his horse to have enough to quicken for a couple of furlongs and win that valuable handicap for the Carl Burke team. I think a listed race, not many runners, soft ground, and he'll go in again. OK, let's get stuck into the Betfred Oaks. Mile and a half, 4.30 on the Friday afternoon. Ylang Ylang was all the rage in the market after a good run in the 1,000 guineas. She was the 11 to 8 favourite for Aidan O'Brien and Ryan Moore. Azalea was in as 13 to 2. Dance sequence, 7 to 1. Quite strong in the market. You've got, to me, Linkfield Oaks trial winner, 15 to 2. Forest Ferry 10s drifting that horse. Rubies of Red was a big drifter on the day, 12 to 1. And it was 16s and bigger the rest. And it is Azalea who wins the Oaks for Dermot Weld and Chris Hayes from Stall 5, beating dance sequence from 2 in War Chimes from stall number seven. Wins despite being the slowest away, the, the leader making dreams, the quickest away, 0 to 20 miles an hour, 2.64. Azalea, 12th of 12, slowest away, 3.26 seconds Azalea took to get to 20 miles an hour. Part of that possibly due to Chris Hayes anxious to just ride a patient race on her. Ryan Moore certainly was anxious to ride a patient race on Ylang Ylang. He sat right out the back along with uh, Rubies are Red and the pace was pretty strong in the early part. Making dreams bowling along for the Carl Burke team. Setting a strong gallop and remember they're going uphill at this stage so they went pretty hard. Secret Satire with the sheepskin noseband who won the Musidora a little bit keen in the early stages and Treasure in His Majesty's The King's colours almost off the bridle already. The principles are towards the rear. They're certainly in the final third of the field. Azalea in the Aga Khan green and dance sequence in the Godolphin blue. They are a place, well, mid-division to rear, mid-division at best, really, They're at this stage. So the first mile here from Azalea's point of view, if you clock what she did, she did 153.34. And the first mile for Luxembourg, 154.94. So she's about a second, a second and a half quicker than Luxembourg was just going through uh, the first mile. So a much more strongly run race uh, than the coronation. And it was won by staying, really, this contest. And I think plenty of the horses in here didn't actually get home. And ultimately, it is dominated by 
two horses by Azalea who stayed best and the wayward dance sequence who's got a real nice turn of foot but she didn't quite last home in uh, the closing stages. Azalea's fastest speed in the race uh, well, she was 38.45 miles per hour. That's as quick as she got. And her fastest furlong was the 10th furlong. So she's going from three to two. She went 11.77 through that uh, particular furlong. That's not the quickest furlong in the race. It belongs to Dan Sequence. She's going to come and do that now through the 10th. Same time as Alias coming on the outside. Dan Sequence there, fires between horses and does 11.57. And just about edges to the front, not much in it, but she might have just got there. And then she hangs all over the place under pressure. Look, she's run down the camber there, almost hits the rail. As Azalea effectively outstays her, look how well spread out they are. Good few non-stayers in there. Might not be a very strong Oaks, but I think the winner's pretty good. She's picked up nicely through the final two furlongs. She went 36.33, the second went 36.63. So 0.3 seconds quicker, Azalea, than Dan's sequence in the last couple of furlongs. And most importantly, she was very strong in the final furlong. There's Dan's sequence, switched to come and challenge. She looked awkward when she was second in the Nell Gwyn. She didn't really run a race in the Guineas. The ground was possibly too fast. But here she's run an awful lot better, but she was very wayward. There you go, she's running into the rail. There she's run out again. She's all over the place, really, isn't she? She gets a slight nudge from Azalea there. But um, it's her running about that's the problem. Azalea's not really caused a real issue. What of some of the vanquished? Ilang Ilang, disappointing. Uh, hard to know what to make of her. She was pretty well positioned the way the race was run. It was quite strongly run. She was quite well positioned. She wasn't far away from where Azalea and Dan Sequence were. She just couldn't finish off. Ryan Moore afterwards said, look, she's better than that. Something wasn't quite right. Um, she's much better than that. A bare result. He did say, she possibly didn't handle the track. I know it's an easy excuse to make, but it, it could well have been the case as far as Ilang Ilang's concerned. She might be a lot better in, in the Irish Oaks if that's uh, where she goes. But, um, well, Azalea does it for Dermot Weld, the master trainer. She'd won the Salsa Bill prior to this. That just a, a group three. She'd won that by staying on strongly. And I put it to you that she is a strong stayer. The gallop there up the hill in the early part of the race was pretty fierce. I know she sat off it, but she had to run hard thereafter, and she just outstayed dance sequence and all of the rest, a number of whom disappointed. Here's the summary then, courtesy of Race IQ. And this tells us that the, the, the speed to 20 miles an hour, and it was 3.26. She was in 12th as she came uh, into that 20 mile an hour zone. But uh, thereafter, Chris Hayes was happy to sit still and bring her home strongly, her fastest furlong was the 10th, 11.77. Finishing speed percentage, pretty good, 110.64, uh, 110.13 uh, for Dan Sequence, who individually fired the fastest furlong of the race, that point when she quickened to the front, and then she decided that she wanted to go and join the buses on the inside. Azalea, a really good winner of the Oaks. Now, one of the best time performances over the two days at Epsom was put up by Royal Scotsman uh, for the Coles, with Jamie Spencer on board. And uh, this is the Saturday winners, and his time was 145.31 over a mile and 113 yards. So 2.41 outside standard. Look at those plus figures in the plus minus column. Miles better than the Friday. We're dealing now with just about good ground overall, whereas we were dealing with nearly soft ground on the first day. Royal Scots will be the first horse we look at, then City of Troy. Here's the Race IQ time index. And we get be much better numbers on day two. Uh, these time index figures, pretty good uh, for the second day. 7.69, the best, 6.95 over the expected. City of Troy was just about bang on what uh, you would have expected at 5.5. But uh, these numbers indicative of better ground and uh, horses posting better time performances than on the Friday. So that Royal Scotsman performance, let's take a look at that. Now, as I said, it's one of the better time figures put up at the whole meeting. It was the Diamed, it was over a mile and 113 yards, joint favourites and Besto in Highland Avenue. Regal Reality fours, ruled you by sixes. Royal Scotsman nibbled out in the market, 17 to two, and it was tens and bigger the rest. This is what can happen if you control a bit of a loony properly and they can go 
and show you exactly what they're capable of. He's out of the stalls really quickly, 2.46 seconds to 20 miles an hour. Royal Dubai, 2.67. Whilst Royal, Royal Dubai, important, well, he finished second, Highland Avenue, the grey horse in the Godolphin Blue was back in third. Jeremy Spencer had no doubt about what he was going to do on Royal Scotsman, who showed himself at times last season to be rank, um, to be difficult to ride, um, didn't want to be restrained in races, and Jamie Spencer decided just to get on with it and let this horse roll. And boy, did he roll along in front, and he got several of his rivals out of their uh, comfort zones. I mean, look at Ryan Moore. He sat last on Regal Reality, who won this race last year. Ryan's a brilliant judge of pace. He obviously thinks he's going, this horse is going a bit quick. And it would have surprised Ryan and others that Jamie Spencer was able to keep this horse rolling in the closing stages. So he's quickest out of the stalls. He records 41.03 miles per hour, one of the quickest mile per hour readings, according to Race IQ, at the meeting. And he comes home really well. His fastest furlong is his seventh. So it's his penultimate furlong, and he comes home in 11.03. Now, we didn't see any furlongs like that on day one, on Oaks Day, when there was more cut in the ground. But look at this, he's got them all in trouble and he fires that 11.03 and runs on really strongly in the closing stages. He's going to be closed down inside the final furlong, which makes you wonder about the trip going forward. For Royal Dubai does run on quite strongly in the latter stages of this race and certainly comes home a little bit quicker, 34.36 compared to 34.82. But Royal Scotsman had destroyed them with his speed earlier in the race and he was not for catching thereafter. Now it's going to be interesting to see what they do with him. He's in the Queen Anne, but making all on the straight mile at Asker is a tough ask. That's a real tough ask. Horses don't often do that. It's a hold up track by and large. He's in the July Cup. It'd be, it'd be really interesting in that, I think, because he's got an absolute ton of speed, this fella. And he's roared home. He's six furlong, 11.26, then at 11.03, 11.16 as well. Uh, really quick few furlongs once he turned into the home straight before getting tired. Uh, in behind, disappointing horses in behind, I thought really. Regal Reality ought to have been able to get closer than he did from where he was. But this fella, he's really classy on his day, and Jamie Spencer was able to guide him from the front to land this diamond stakes in tremendous style, really. He's a very likeable character. He's a bit of a nut job, but, but he's a very talented one at that. And he's got a massive engine as well. And it's about harnessing that. And they tried to harness it last year. He just couldn't. He just wouldn't settle. He just wouldn't relax in his races. But he seemed to relax in front, although Jamie did admit afterwards he didn't always feel in control. Let's have a look at well, the Race IQ data. Tell us about that and sum it all up. Well, first. Uh, for 0 to 20 miles an hour for Royal Scotsman, quickest away. Sean was second uh, quickest away, and he fired um, one really, really strong furlong. I wouldn't give up on him. He was unlucky when he ran in Dubai a couple of times uh, in March. 10.93, that's a quick seventh furlong from Sean. So just keep a, a quiet eye on him. But um, overall, Royal Scotsman had too much sustained speed uh, for this lot. 106.57 is finishing speed percentage. He might just be a sprinter, you know. Time now to have a look at the big one, the Betfred Derby on Saturday afternoon. And this was how they bet. City of Troy, 3-1. to 9-2 to two, ambient friendly. It was all the rage just before the race. Ancient Wisdom, 6-1. to one. Sixes Los Angeles, Dancing Gemini, 8s, 14s, and bigger at the rest. I think that the ground by this stage of the afternoon at 4.30 was good, according to the times. City of Troy from stall one. Oh, that's no good for him, we were told. Ambient Friendly from six, Los Angeles from four, and Dare a Mile from 14. Ninth quickest away, uh, City of Troy, 3.1 seconds to get to 20 miles an hour. His stable companion, Pace Setter, much, quickly, much more quickly away, 2.76 seconds uh, for Euphoric, who um, rolls along in front. You remember Euphoric made the, the running in the Leopardstown Derby trial for Los Angeles, and Los Angeles sits handy as well. He's in those... Um, so the purple colours with a bit of red on it. He was very reluctant to go into the stalls. He's a huge horse, he's clearly a bit claustrophobic and doesn't really, doesn't really like them. And um, it took a while to get him in. But anyway, he jumped out and he's run a big race. He did best of those horses that raced 
up towards the four. You just saw Vintage running loose after stumbling and getting rid of Pat Dobbs in the early part of the race. And uh, he gets involved in the closing stages. Where's Ryan Moore? Well, this is interesting, isn't it? City of Troy is towards the rear. He's going very strongly, but Ryan's got him anchored and he's got plenty of cover as well at this stage in a race where they're going quite hard in the early stages and Ryan was happy to sit back. I think what the O'Brien team had decided to do is have Los Angeles handy. He looked like a strong stayer at Leopardstown and would easily get a mile and a half. And we know that City of Troy has tons of speed. He showed it last year in the superlative. He showed it in the Dewhurst. They wanted to harness that speed and utilize it in the closing stages. And that's exactly what happened in this contest. He was too quick for his rivals through the final three furlongs. Now, the problem could be for Ryan that he was going to get trouble in running. He's tracking ambient friendly in the yellow, the Gredley colors. But what happens is they go quite quick down the hill and they get spread out and gaps begin to appear that allows Ryan to find a passage through horses on City of Troy, who I think is a tremendous winner of the Derby. I think he's a really top-class racehorse, and there's going to be tons more to come from him. I'd be surprised if he was ever beaten again. Just there, it looked as if there's going to be a problem for Ryan. But now he gets out, and City of Troy gets rolling. His ninth furlong, 11.74. He's beginning to get going. Ryan's having a look down the inside. And he fires that 11.74. He backs it up with an 11.82. And now he's on the heels of the leaders. Euphoric tiring. Los Angeles, a bit one-paced. 11.82 done. And he's got to the front. Now he does 11.99 and he gets rid of Ambient Friendly. Watch what he does in a moment. Just as Ambient Friendly threatens to rally and get to him. Watch his leg change. He changes his legs there and there, and he fires away from there, bang! And he fires away from Ambient Friendly, chasing the loose horse. Just when it looked like Ambient Friendly was gonna to get to him, he changed his legs, he changed gear, and he cleared right away. But it was the 11.74, 11.82, and 11.99 that took him to the front, and nothing in the race could live with him there. That 11.74, was his fastest in the race and it was good enough. You may compare those sectionals in the closing stages with August Rodin. Well, August Rodin was quicker, quite simply that, going in pursuit of King of Steel. But August Rodin was racing in a race that wasn't quite as strongly run and on better ground as well. This race was pretty strongly run. That's why you mark up Los Angeles. Look how well strung out they are. The city of Troy was just way too good for them. Look how he moves. There you go. See him stretching. He's a horse who stretches. He's not got a very high cadence. He's not got much knee curl either. He's able to change his legs adroitly, as we showed. Just there, you see it again. But whether he wants to run on dirt, I don't know, looking at his action. He might just be so good that he could get away with running on dirt in the Travers, which has been mentioned and maybe the Breeders' Cup Classic somewhere down the line. But he doesn't necessarily move like an archetypal dirt horse. But his dad was, Justify was a brilliant dirt horse. That might persuade them to have a go. Here's his individual sectionals. You can see where he sat in the race. 15th to start with. Majorly in ninth. That's where he raced for most of the race. Then he made his move. Second column after nine furlongs. And those three sub-12 sectionals took him to the front and he cleared away to be a brilliant derby winner. Some thought he hadn't trained on after what he did uh, in the Guineas. Well, he had. He can still run fast and he can run very fast indeed. And he is a tremendous racehorse, one to be very, very excited about. That is it for the verdict this week. I hope you enjoyed looking back on the Oaks and on that very special performance in the derby. Bye-bye.